Hey, holers, it's your boy Decky and the gang. Today we have a very special guest. His name is David Gold, and one of my community members found him on TikTok a couple of weeks ago and showed me some videos of him. And most of the videos were David working out, and David is an older gentleman, I think in his 60s. And uh, it's mostly David working out at the gym, talking about how he's getting ready for a big wrestling match. And that's how I was first introduced to David. And I sent these same videos to the guys. And and we were all kind of intrigued by it. And I told him that I was trying to get him on the show. And so we were all happy about it. It was after the fact that I did a more deep dive on David and I saw more of his videos. And I the 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 wrestling and the weightlifting is much more of a minor part of his content creation career on TikTok. It's mostly about the Zodiac Killer and how he was associated with him in certain ways. Not his friend, though. Um, the Zodiac tried to kill him. So we we were all a little bit caught off guard. I mean, I I had I had done a deep dive and I had understood why this was that was more of his content. But the rest of the guys definitely were not expecting this when we started the episode today. So we're gonna start the episode now. But that's just a little little heads up as to why maybe some of us were caught off guard. This program contains violent content, which may be too intense for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> Well, sure. hey, let me just say something about this, if you'd like, uh, to get it started off, because there are a lot of people, uh, you guys age, who've never heard of the Zodiac Killer. And, you know, this guy wore a mask like this, mm -hmm. and he killed people. He's admitted to four murders. That's the only thing that they really accept as being... Uh, uh, that, that he killed four people, okay? Uh, four murders, but there were two, three people in each murder. I'll, I can tell you more about those as we go on, but because uh, I have them up here on my screen. But uh, in my estimation, this these guys, first of all, it wasn't just one man. It was three guys. If you research all of the murders that they uh, think they may have done, which they did, because he used to brag to me about them in Mexico City, but he never would say he killed anybody. Frank Morris was a a riddler. He 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 would uh, he everybody he said that all of everybody that knew him said that he was full of riddles and clues, and you would have to figure the rest of it out on your own. And I really didn't until after I wrote the book. Then all all of a sudden everything started coming clear and all these different things that had happened to me with these guys started making sense and everything that he said started making sense. But he did a lot of other things too. On the book, you'll see on the cover, there's uh, the three guys that escaped Alcatraz. There is D.B. Cooper. They did that. This is the Texas Moonlight Murders. They did that. And this is uh, another picture of the Zodiac Killer. But they also, uh, they did the, and he hinted around and, and sort of, you know, you know, left me with ideas about a lot of murders that when, now that I know what happened and I've studied pictures of these guys and remember everything about who they are and all that, um, the murders, um, uh, start making sense that they were the Zodiac killers because one time I asked him, because he would never say murder anybody, say, we take these people to be our slaves in hell. And if you don't know anything about the Zodiac Killer, he actually put that on letters and sent it to the press in San Francisco so that they would send it to the uh, to the police department. With the ciphers, yeah. And, yeah, with the ciphers. And he showed me those ciphers. He offered me a key to the one cipher. The one that they just saw part of it, I, rem I I didn't remember it, but I used to see it and say, oh, I think he told me what that meant. I don't remember. When they figured it out, I was like, yeah, that's what he told me. So I made a video on that and put it on, on YouTube. And, um, the, the take, you know, he would say, we take these people to be our, our, uh, slaves. And I go, what do you mean slaves? Well, they're going to be our slaves in hell. And I go, man, you're crazy. He goes, yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> And he goes, they say I'm insane. And I go, man, what do you, you know, I mean, I knew nothing about this guy except that he was a guy that I would walk past his place on, uh, in Mexico City on my way to a restaurant to get something to eat. And then he would stop and talk to me. And that's how the book starts out, the, the first uh, meeting there. Then um, well, as um, we go uh, you you want to you guys? Yeah, let me. I got a question about this because I actually live in Mexico City right now. 
Great. Um, you're like, I'm, I'm from I'm from the U.S., but yeah, yeah, this is Mexico. Um, I oh, live in man. in Roma. I want what some, do you, you live do you, in Roma? Yeah. What neighborhood were you in, or if you okay. don't like mind asking? San Cosme. He lived in San Cosme. If you look up on YouTube, I have a video of where I looked it up on Google Maps, and it looks like I was standing in front of his house, and I filmed that the place where he lived, and I filmed uh, enough to show you that. Uh, uh, that that's where he was at but i can and i live five blocks from there up the yeah. street but i can tell you easily how to find it it's right next door to the holiday inn that's next door to the uh, what's that the, the what's that restaurant that has the three owls on it oh the, um it's not I mean, it's, v, really it's not popular. vip but there's nothing it's I not talk. vips not vips uh, sh, sh, uh i'll remember not it in but, but anyway, no, not if you know where that one is <laughs> at on in for Hinges, right before San Cosme. Huh, yeah, yeah. Like San Cosme is in the south of the city, correct? Oh, I think so. Uh, that city is so big, you know. You yeah, 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 yeah. No, I just, <laughs> but yeah. The, when but I was... if you know where that's at, he, I can tell you how to get to the place where he lived. So you huh. can just look at it and and then it'll make things fit together. The, it's behind the this restaurant. I should have looked that up. No, it's no, no, it's totally okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and behind the re and behind the restaurant, the first building after you know you go across the street, first building is now a Holiday Inn, and next to that is a a place where these someone owned it back then and rented it out, and he was they were renting out three rooms where they stayed there. Okay. So that, you know, I mean that's you. you I, Without the name of that restaurant, it really because they used to kill people in the parking lot of that restaurant. And wow. um, okay, and I there's a story in my book where he tried to shoot me in the face after walking down this road that went between the Holiday Inn, which wasn't Holiday Inn then, but uh, it was as an apartment complex between the Holiday Inn and that restaurant. Uh, we walked down the road, and he had me oh, have a seat. I want to talk to you. And he reaches in under his shirt and pulls out a gun and points it at me. And, I mean, it's just incredible how I got out of that. I'm not going to – I don't want to take up a lot of time with it, but that's no, one that of the – No, that sounds very in interesting. If, well, if you're open to sharing about that, we'd love to hear it. Yeah. And uh, well, was this the I, first time you met this, him? But, say again? Was this the very first time you had an interaction no, with him? No. Okay. No. It may have not even been – I don't know if it was even the first year. I don't think it was the first year because the first year I only met him a couple of times and I managed to get out of there, but he tried, they tried to corner me at the bus station and get me out and get me out of there and, and take me somewhere. And th uh, their thing is torture them and kill because they get sexually turned on by uh, making people suffer and, uh, and, and then killing them, watching them die. So, the oh man, uh, and when I start going back and remembering all these things, <laughs> I gotta get some water. Yeah, well, it, it's it, totally okay. It, it, it's kind of a, a rough deal because you couldn't do anything about it, you know. I I went to the police, and I, I hate this stuff because when I put this on the internet, they go, Why didn't you go to the police? Well, why are you assuming I didn't? But the police <laughs> wouldn't do anything. See, the these guys escaped from Alcatraz. Alcatraz was the FBI's prison. J. Edgar Hoover built that for uh, the Machine Gun Kelly and uh, whatever kind of murderers they had back then. And the, who was that boss of the mafia that uh, Al Capone and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. And um, he no one had ever escaped. Now. You guys haven't been around as long as I have, but when I was a kid in the 60s, they had commercials, even in the 50s, they had commercials about Alcatraz, and they would say, they would show somebody going, ah, Alcatraz, and then they would say, you know, kids, be good, because if you're not bad, you will end up in Alcatraz, and it's an escape-proof prison, and, they, they, you know, they're advertising as an escape-proof prison. Well, according to Frank, 14 people escaped from there, and several of them um, successfully, and I have a story about that too, because one of them com communicated with me on YouTube. But huh. you know, I, we can go on forever and ever. Okay, <laughs> stop me somewhere <laughs> and ask something. Uh, so, well, on this, uh, you from from what I've gathered from your TikToks, you were saying yeah, three men escape from Alcatraz. You have Frank Lee Morris, and then you have John England and Clarence. 
England. The Clarence Brunches. Angman, exactly. And, and they're supposed to have drowned, according to the FBI. But yet, the uh, they found the raft that they paddled across with, and they tell you that they swam across when they didn't swim. According to Frank, they never got wet. He told me the whole story. He said, we didn't get in the water. They got wet because it got splashed, but they never got in the water. He said the water was so cold that when a drop would hit you, it felt like getting shot with a bullet. Huh. But uh, they, uh, I don't know how much of that story can I tell. I don't want to go in too deep. Uh, uh, you can go as deep as you want on any of this. It's just up, yeah. up to what you're, you feel okay sharing. Have you seen Escape yeah. from Alcatraz with Clint Eastwood? That's one of my favorite movies, actually. Parts of it. Oh, great. Yeah, parts of it. And yeah. I, I used to love Clint Eastwood, but I hate it because he made this serial killer famous. He right. made uh, these guys look like good people and they're psycho uh, necrophiliacs. They cut their, uh, they would spend so much time to kill someone and torture them, they wouldn't take time to eat. Food was not that important to them. So when they would kill the person, they'd cut their throat and drink their blood. Interesting. And right. I figure, and I, and I, from, from, the, from some of the things that they've said and some things I've seen them do, they would cook parts of these people's body and eat them. I hate to tell you that because when I was seeing this, I was a kid and I didn't know what they were doing. And, and this was but, in Mexico City. What years were these uh, that you were? Okay, this wasn't them? in Mexico City. This was happening in oh. Florida. There's going to be some time discrepancies you're not going to understand. Mm -hmm. This was uh, in Mexico City started around 69 or 70. Okay. Okay. But strange uh, uh, coincidence of events. When I was uh, born, uh, a little kid in, in a place. In Tampa, Florida, there was a street we lived on called Minnehaha, and I have some a chapter in the book on Minnehaha Street. And um, there, Frank had a niece or a cousin who lived three blocks from me, and I would play hopscotch with her, and then I would go to the park, which was a block from her house, and play at the park and then come home. I was five years old. And my mom kept telling me not to leave, you know, the house, but I did it anyway. I was a hyperactive kid, and back then they didn't know what to do with hyperactive kids. <laughs> So um, one day they were there. They end up tying me to a post, try to cut my throat. I got out of that one too. But uh, that was in 1958. Okay. <clears throat> and how? In what was the age discrepancy between you and and Frank and the uh, England brothers? The the Anglins were around 27, I think, then, and 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 Frank was 30, and I was five. Okay, so over 20 years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, see, around 62 or 60, they, they escaped from Alcatraz in, gee, I used to know it, 611, 62, I think it was. I but, looked it up. Uh, yeah, it was 62 that all three of them escaped. I've been, I've been researching. I'm so excited. Yeah, and in that same year, we moved to a different place. So when they escaped, they came back to Tampa, but the girl the niece she moved shortly after they got uh busted for the what do you call it um uh, for, for that bank they robbed up in alabama that got them ultimately put into alcatraz the anglin brothers uh, okay, okay. i have to tell you that's a whole story in its own i could write a book about that they're standing outside <laughs> my window talking to me about this no nah, we're not gonna hurt you don't worry after they tried to kill me two or three times but anyway um backtracking again to where were we at <laughs> uh in tampa with their niece when, when yeah. you were a child yeah <laughs> yeah so that was in 58 and in 60 around 62 we moved to another part of the uh you know, of tampa which in lived in a complex called buffalo estates which had a creek that went through it called six mile creek it actually had two creeks that came together now these guys notorious notoriously would find waterways like that and catch kids that were going swimming and torture them and kill them i'm looking for a picture here if i have i have a picture here somewhere um uh, yeah oh, man, that's the pines card no this is it this is a picture that frank claims he had a lot to do with drawing this you, you probably won't be able to see it but down here in the bottom let me see right here you'll see some guys walking with a bucket and everything and there's a uh -huh. sign there that says 
something about the river or something like that. Yeah, Blanco uh, River. Blanco River. Yeah, mm-hmm. Blanco River. And they were going down there, and they were, and you see this guy's fishing. He's got a, a fishing rod and something hanging from it. And I go, yeah, that's kind of weird. It's a, looks like a fish, but it's got two legs. And he goes, yeah, it's a two-legged fish. The the whole gist of this thing is they're telling he's telling you that they would go down to the river, catch these kids, and bring them back, torture them, and kill them, and do whatever they wanted to do to them. And there's a guy right here who's got uh a bucket of water and he said i just want you to know that that's a bucket of water that's important don't forget that and i never did but i it was just recently that i well in the last few years that i figured out what that water was about uh it was about not getting caught because you could use the water to clean the blood off of you but uh, okay, uh, okay makes sense uh-huh yeah. so that that's why bring water zodiac, up, yeah. part, part of the reason the zodiac killer never got caught and one thing we need to uh keep in mind Frank Morris was a genius with an a IQ of about 133, which was in the top 2% of the population at that time. So what you have here is a mastermind killer. He told me, he said, you know what? Everything you do is for good, but everything we do is for bad. And that basically explains it. Criminal, uh, a criminal mind, but with the high intelligent quotient. And there's all kinds of stuff on here about all the people that they killed. I'd have to get this to where you could see it. But that's the, that's the important part because they dammed up the Six Mile Creek uh, behind my house, which was, you know, you had to walk down there a little ways. It's probably a half mile, but you're going through the woods and everything. And I'd go down there and go swimming, and they were catching kids there and killing them. And uh, that was after they escaped from Alcatraz the FBI's unescapable prison. So when they did escape, they, uh, the, the, they, they sent a boat out and there's a video on YouTube about this. They, the, the, the guards who actually went to get the boat tell you their story. And they brought, they brought his, their raft back and it was full of blood. He said it was full of blood because they captured this guy and cut him and had their fun after being in jail and not being able to do it for a couple years. And they, uh, and they tied it off at the dock and they went home or whatever. And the next day when they came back, it was gone. And there were no word, no one knew where it went. And the, and the uh, what do you call it? The prison warden basically said, shut up, you know, <laughs> yeah. leave it alone. Cause the FBI had came and got it. And then years later, it suddenly appears out of nowhere or something like that. I don't know. But the FBI knew that these guys made it and they didn't want anybody to know that they're, um, their, what do you call <clears throat> their escape proof prison was actually not escape proof. Yeah. The people had left. And yeah. J Edgar Hoover couldn't handle that. His had a big ego and you know, crazy. Uh, but he, the, uh, but these guys escaped and he didn't want them to know. So they FBI actually covered the whole thing up. And from then on, they covered up their murders because I got together with, uh, a state trooper in Florida who lived behind me and a city police officer who would come up to where I worked. And all these stories are in the book too, by the way. And the state trooper, cause kids were disappearing and everything and weird things were happening to me with these guys. And uh, I was always getting away and the guy, the cop kept, kept telling me to stay in your house and lock the doors, but I was just too hyperactive. I couldn't do that. And, uh, they actually walked in on me one time, but I had a gun and I made them walk back out. I tell that story sometime. <laughs> but anyway, um, when did the, you write the book? Was it 2017 that it was came out, or or what, when was the book actually out? Yeah, probably 217 might I, be uh, around then. I want to tell you something about this cop, okay? Before, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't oh, want sorry. To get off of it. We we can get off subject as long as we go back. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, stay on. Uh, let yeah, me look tell in us about the, the book cop. here and see. There's a date in there. Yeah, 2017, it says in the book, copyrighted. Okay. So around then. The, um, the cop, here. this is proof that the FBI was cover, were covering it up. Uh, this state patrol, state trooper went to his supervisors and asked them if they could get him stationed there because he was stationed in a different part of the town or whatever so that he could help me with these guys. Because he suspected that it was the guys from, that escaped from Alcatraz that were doing this and these murders. And um, and they weren't finding any bodies. These guys would bury them and all that kind of thing. 
but uh, they finally dug one body up that was on the way to the swimming hole. But uh, they, the cop told me that, I said, he said, what's, I told him, what's going on with that? And he said, no, they won't let me come over. And I go, why? And he goes, well, it's something political. And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, well, they're, in, in a case like this, you have, we have to get the FBI involved. And the FBI said, leave it alone. And I go, leave it alone. People are disappearing and they found some dead people and everything. What? How can you leave it alone? And these guys are here all the time. All they got to do is go catch them. Nope. The FBI said, leave it alone. So Frank Morris one time told me in Mexico City the, that J. Edgar Hoover put him and his buddies in the population control business. Think about that. How do you control population? By killing people. Yeah. That's, that's what he said. He made a joke out of it. So is that why the FBI wouldn't chase him? They wouldn't go after him because they didn't. They would have to admit that they escaped that from their escaped, escape yeah. from prison. And they would also have to sooner or later, people are going to find out that they covered it up. Yeah. So you're just watching their own ass. So, so until today, my story cannot get told because of that. Okay. A lot of people and, just don't want to believe it, but other than I then, totally have you been contact like have the police or FBI talked to you after that about shutting up or anything? Is there been anything like that? No, no, never. Never. The FBI have never talked to me. The you know what's interesting? There I was around a lot of these murders and saw things happen that I wasn't sure what happened, but cop friends told me somebody got killed, you know, they're killing somebody. And uh but no one nothing ever got done and you would think that what do cops do nowadays if they say uh, you i mean i would be the first person that i would think that they would go check with just ask hey what the hell happened yeah, as a witness yeah they i think the fbi knew that i was closely involved with these guys and was constantly escaping from them so they would tell the police leave him alone yeah avoid you no one ever asked huh. me any questions. That was really strange to me that no one ever asked me any questions about that. But I did have an FBI agent who's actually in charge now of the uh, that whole area up there where all that happened in San Francisco, and he's a patient of mine. He comes around and every once in a while, and I t told him the story, and he says, uh, can I bring you some pictures and you see if you can pick anybody out? He put the pictures on the desk and I picked this picture out of, of one of them that would look just like D.B. Cooper. I said, that's a guy I know in Mexico City. And he goes, you sure? And I go, I, I wasn't sure at the time. I got back then. I wouldn't be sure of anything. But, you know, after studying everything, that was him. And uh, he told me that, well, you know, basically uh, write a book about it because i told him is there anything to be done about it because they're still down back then they were still down there in mexico yeah <laughs> and he goes there's nothing we can do about it uh just want to write a book about it so that's what set me into writing the book excuse me <laughs> yeah that's fascinating so the what i've gathered is like you've had basically especially since you were saying since the niece and we live close to you, you've kind of had a lifelong acquaintance not a friendship or anything but acquaintance been, with these guys woven there... in and out of my entire life up until about in the 90s when i was in chiropractic college i went down there and i met with frank not because i ever wanted to meet with him but i had to walk by his house and he'd come out and talk to me and uh that it was in the 90s so it, up until the 90s he, when he he asked me what i was doing i told him i was in chiropractic college but I had already started to spe suspect this guy and think you know i should be more careful and i had friends telling me you're talking to a murderer stay away from him be careful whatever and uh but i always won you know i always got away so i didn't think that much of it mm -hmm. but uh at that time when he asked me that i told him and this is really weird you know because how good can this guy know me from just the times we talk for a few minutes he goes where are you at and i where are you going to chiropractic college at and i lied about it i told him and i, I wasn't uh, i've never been uh very good at lying so but i everybody told me don't tell him where you're at or where you're going or anything yeah. and uh <laughs> I, he tracked me from Mexico City to my house when I was 16 because I gave him my address. Or I didn't give him my address, but I got close enough that he went there and found me anyway. But anyhow, I I, uh, I told him that I was in a different chiropractic college than the one I was in. And he just looked right at me as soon as I finished naming the chiropractic college. And he goes, you're lying. But 
whatever, you know, I don't know what, I mean, he just knew just like that, that I was lying about it. And I'm like, yeah, but he, huh. he, you know, they never came to look for me. He said, you're lucky. He's, oh yeah, that's what he said. He said, but you're lucky again. And I go, cause he always tell me that when I get away, you're, you're lucky. You're the, you're the luckiest guy. He goes, you're really the one that got away. And I said, what do you mean? I'm lucky. He goes, well, we don't do our work in Texas. And I go, why? And he goes, cause the ground's too hard. I don't know if you guys, any of you guys have ever been to Texas, but when it's dry, you, you, you have to have a backhoe to dig in the ground. I thought they were in some kind of business that had to do with burying pipes. Cause I was, cause I'd seen them bury people. It looked like they were burying a pipe and I'm because of, we saw some hair in one end and maybe shoes in the other. I'm figuring now they were buried people in there. And I know so where at least one of those graves is at, but, they, uh, where was I at on that? Uh, just about, yeah, they're not doing work in Texas. They don't do any work in Texas. Oh, yeah, they, yeah. And I know now because I moved here and I got a ranch, and it's like when it gets hot and dry, you can't break that ground. Even mm -hmm. with a backhoe, I don't think you could break it. It's like concrete. It dries out because it's clay soil. And that's what he was talking about. Well, why would you need to dig in your line of business? Because when they kill somebody, they dig a shallow grave and bury them. Another reason they never get caught. And I'm pretty sure he learned these things from other murderers in uh, prison when he was in prison who told him, yeah, I killed, they only know about this one. I killed who knows how many. He said yeah. that the key is to bury them and make it look like, you know, because they're not going to go out there and find them and put them somewhere and don't leave any evidence behind. And they were very, very good at that. So that and leads me to, or, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was gone. I'm, I'm, I can lead into other things. Other things will be here all night. <laughs> well, no, that's what that's what I find fascinating is because I was gonna say, from what we know, yeah, the Zodiac killer killed you know a certain number of people over in San Francisco area. I, I know that there's oh. been speculation that there's been some other people in different parts of the country, but it was always yeah. those those four. Um, yeah. As far as is the Zodiac killer just Frank, or is it all three of them? And all three of them. Okay, so the Zodiac killer, make, although seen as one person, is actually three. Is actually three. And people think that the Zodiac killer wore this mask all the time when he killed people. They only wore it once. Okay. At Lake, the Lake Berryessa murder, which is rather interesting because in Lake Berryessa, there was a guy named Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Ann Shepard, who they stabbed. And some crazy things happened up there that make people think it's just really confusing. But I have all of those questions answered in my book and my videos. Brian Hartnell is now an attorney. Probably, yeah, he's probably still working. Uh, and he will not talk about this case. He, he gave one interview and he wouldn't talk about it after that. And uh, Frank told me that, you know, he had a business dealing with this guy. And the way he said it made me think they had some drug dealings going on or something. And the guy's an attorney. He's going to keep his mouth shut about it. I sent him an email. Hey, I knew these guys, and I named the, who, who. I kind of figured out who, uh, what name he was using back then. And I think it was Frankie Lyons. And, you know, I, he just didn't answer it. But there's so many people that want to stay out of it because they were get involved with Frank, you know. Not necessarily in murders, but drugs. He was into drugs and, and that, Okay, too. yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had relations and, that they didn't want to be tied to it. Yeah, and they may, and possibly jealousy for, because the girl was with him instead of someone else. That's how there was another guy that got involved in this whole thing. His name was, uh, uh, oh man, I don't remember his name. Alan, uh, yeah, and it's going to go away from me now. But right. he, but he, he, uh, he was there at Lake Berryessa. People saw him. So that's what he, people think that he is the Zodiac killer and people won't let go of that. Well, he was there. Frank said that they took him up there uh, as a graduation ceremony. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he didn't tell me we took him to a murder. OK, we just took him up to the lake where there was some people there that we had some dealings with, you know, and we we're kind of mad at this couple and whatever. And uh, this guy was going to a graduation ceremony. Like, what do you mean graduation ceremony? Well, I mean, some people need to graduate from certain things. They, like hunting, you know, you hunt, uh, 
you hunt small prey and then you get better at it and you graduate up to bigger prey. And I'm like, oh, what does he mean? Well, he's talking about graduate because because a lot most of these murderers start out killing little animals when they're young okay. because they get that thrill off of it, whatever thrill they get from little animals. And then they sooner or later graduate to humans. Some of them don't. And this guy, Arthur Lee Allen, Arthur Lee Allen never graduated. That was his graduation ceremony. He didn't make it. Mm. You hear the story about that. You have to, you have to know the story. Cause they're like, he, they came out from behind a tree. One man came out, he went back. All of a sudden the man came out with the, mask on and everything like that and nobody can answer the questions and somebody saw Arthur Lee Allen up there and it had to be him and the weight fit and that kind of thing and just all kind of weird but I know the whole story and I know what actually happened. So Arthur Lee Allen went up there with them. They killed that couple but he was just watching. Yeah, I think what happened was they he was they sent Arthur Lee Allen with the suit to hide behind a tree to go over there and uh, and do this, and he couldn't do it. And he's probably sitting there behind the tree looking back, and they, one of them stepped out of the bushes. I think it was probably Frank stepped out of the bushes, like mad at him because you need to do this, you know. And uh, they saw him. The, the Brian and his girlfriend saw, saw him standing out of the bushes. So he walked over behind the tree. So I'm thinking that uh, he, at first I thought he put on the suit because Arthur Leon wouldn't put it on, but I don't think so. I think uh, one of the Anglins, probably John, because John did most of the dirty work, John got behind that tree or was already there with Arthur Leon, it was a pretty big tree, and put the suit on and then went over here and told these guys, get down on your knees, we just want your belongings, tied them up and then threw them down and started stabbing them. And somewhere in there they they would take turns of stabbing uh, while one of them watched and they would have sexual things with each other while they were watching the you know two of them while they were watching one of them abuse this person and they would get off on it you know and uh, that's the kind of what happened up there uh, in short and and then they wrote some stuff on the side of a car. He said something to me about that. He was just make, laughing and laughing about, can you imagine they'd take the whole door off the car for evidence? Where the hell did they put it? They got it up in them. It must have doors all over the place. You know, how, where do they have that much space at? And, and he's laughing and laughing while he's telling this. And he goes, the, the, and can you imagine this poor guy? He didn't do anything, and he had to drive home in a car with no door on it. <laughs> And, and it's just, uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. But all of the time he's telling me this, he's never told him, never told me they stabbed anybody. He never told me they killed anybody, but, uh, it's always just alluded me. to you. He would never actually admit it to you. Yeah. Cause sometimes I would ask him, you almost sound like you're telling me that you killed somebody. You go, nah, I never killed anybody. What are you talking about? No, no, I'm just telling you this. And, and it would stick in my mind, you know, and now I can go back and, studied and studied and studied all these murders and go, yeah, that's what he was talking about. I think the first one was uh, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen shot him in their car and he really, uh, uh, I think by then, somewhere in there he talked, because I remember him talking about shooting a guy in the knee and he goes, the guy jumped and pushed into the back seat from uh, whatever and you know, he might try to make it look like an accident. Oh, well, we were just pointing a gun at him, but, you know, he got shot in the knee. And try to play it down, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was a kid at the time, and I was, my mom was very good, still is very good at shutting things out when she wasn't comfortable. Okay. And I think, and I think what I did was I just didn't understand any of that stuff. I'm 16 years old. I just shut it out. And when I wrote the book, everything started coming back. And yeah, you piece thing. it together. Yeah, I'm glad it didn't come back back then. <laughs> it's probably I would, best. Tell my, I would go home and tell my parents about that, and I had a police officer friend at work that I would go who who would come to work to see me, and I would tell him the story uh, of what happened and what they told me, and he would be going, "Yes, that's the the Lake Berry yes, a murder. That's the Lake Berry." And I said, "Well, he never said he murdered anybody. Yeah, they stabbed these this guy and his girlfriend." I, I'm not like really. 
you know, that's how much I brought home from, uh, from it, but I brought home the story. And uh, I told him about the other ones and everything. But, they, you know, again, they can't do anything because uh, the FBI won't get involved. Yeah, in people to leave it alone. Leave it alone. Yeah. Uh, that's so, my, the thing that I'm really fascinated about is, yeah, your relation with these three. Um, because, like, they, they did try to kill you. You escaped oh, yeah. a ton of times, but it also seems like you had the chance to have normal conversations with them where they weren't attempting to take your life. Yeah, because Frank uh, was a schizophrenic psychopath with multiple personalities. He even told me that he had multiple personalities, and I didn't know why he told me that, but now I know because, you know, I'd go by and, hey, how you doing? Come on over and let's talk. And we'd talk a little bit, and he would sometimes say, Start getting like this, and go, I got, I got to go in. I got to go in. I got to go inside, because he wanted to kill me so bad that he he knew he needed to get inside. Because if he did it right there, there'd be a lot of witnesses. Okay, yeah. And he was intelligent enough to stay away from it. Now he had uh, watched these. You know, back then they would imagine in a prison. You're in this. They, they take them to this dark room and let them watch movies, and the movies are all about murder because that's what they like. And there's one of them called Dr. Zodiac. I think it was Dr. Zodiac, yeah, who owned this island, and he would change the lights out in the water so that they would crash the ships, and he'd go get the people off the ships. And then he'd let them go, and he would hunt them down at night and try and shoot them and tell them that if they could get away the next day, by if they lived till the next day, they he would let them go. And uh, he, it's an old black and white movie, and... Um, he played out that part for me one day. He would get all drunk and high on everything. I was, it was late and I was, went past his house and come here and he goes, because of uh, something you did, we're going to, we're going to kill you. And I go, what do you, and that didn't mean anything to me because my dad was always saying, I'm going to kill you. That just meant I was going to get beat, you know? Yeah. And, and he, he told me that and I go, yeah, you've been telling me that for years, but I'm still here. And he goes, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you I don't know. I think he told it to me just like that. If you can live until tomorrow morning, uh, we'll let you go. He goes, we'll even give you an hour head start, two hours, three hours. We'll give you a three hour head start. And I told him, okay, give me three hours and then let's see what happens. Okay. But watch your back. Okay. Because I'm going to get one of you if I don't get y'all. And I went home and got in my damn house and locked the freaking door and I didn't come back out until the next day. <laughs> And there's he and John Anglin was standing on the stairway when uh, I stepped out and I looked at him like, you know, he was there by himself. I'm going to throw down with this guy. I was a wrestler, you know, in high school. I wasn't afraid to fight anybody. And I was going to throw down with him. And I turned around and I went back inside and I told the lady that I, I lived there with, who was my dad's girlfriend. I told I told her and eventually they got married. I told her, uh, I said, there's, there's that guys out there, one of those guys that I told you about last night. And uh, and she goes, let me see. And I go, I don't think they should see you. You don't want them to see you. And we went outside. They were gone. And I go downstairs, and I could sense that they were hiding behind some of the cars in the little parking lot there, which was enclosed. Uh, really kind of eerie, you know. But uh, I, I, I survived another one. <laughs> That's yeah, that is bizarre because you also made it from some of your TikToks. You talked about um, the reporter from the Zodiac killings in San Francisco. He said he had a gun. And then there's another time you instant uh, referenced oh, the guy from America's Most Wanted. Um, I don't remember his name, but you referenced him talking about having a gun. And you made it sound like the Zodiac killer didn't mess with people who actually like were threatening to fight back. Yeah, yeah. He, he was very uh, well. Um, Frank was very afraid of getting hurt or injured or killed he was really scared of other people having guns and i carried i became a an armed security officer for a while and i had a police officer's license for two years i carried a gun everywhere i went and they really stopped messing with me and one night they got in my house and my gun was on the bedside table and i was asleep and i sensed it and i kind of woke up and john anglin was within 12 inches of getting that gun and i struck it like a rattlesnake and grabbed the gun and he was going out and I'm yelling, I'm going to shoot you in your ass. And he flew. Ah. <laughs> and I went outside and I started screaming, I'm going to kill you. Just act crazy. You know, that's what they are. I'm going to kill you all. I'm going to kill you guys. I don't know. I didn't know how many there were there, but I, 
you know, stay out of my house, stay away from me, whatever, what? and carry that gun around. Cause as long as I had the gun, they wouldn't, he never would talk to me. And I never, when he was at that house and he came around me, he wouldn't talk to me because, and I didn't know it was the same guy that I had talked to in Mexico city. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. How many, how many all... overall encounters do you think you had with them where they were trying to kill you? At least a hundred. 50, right. 100. I, mean, I keep remembering them and remember them. I've got 250 videos on YouTube about it. Yeah. And a book, a book that was so thick, I had to throw out two or three chapters because they, they said it was too many pages. Mm -hmm. But I, I can huh. sit here and tell you about different attempts on my... And a lot of times, I didn't know they were trying to kill me. I just figured some jackass is trying to bother me, and I see three of them trying to triangulate on me. I'm getting out of town, I, you know, and I would escape from them. Yeah, but then they would get someone else who was nearby. Yeah, I heard you say something about D.B. Cooper. Wow, man. Let me just tell you something right away. Every one of these murders, uh, the crazy murders that uh, they don't even know about, like the Black Dahlia, Frank wrote uh, collages and sent them to the police or to the press so that they would go to the police. And when I read the collages, because I've read enough of stuff, his things that he put in front of me, I know it's him. Uh, that That's he, him that wrote that. And it's all about taunting the police and, you know, making the whole thing look funny. And he, he really got off on that, on promoting himself that way. Huh. It's just... tell me it's all about promotion. Hmm. But the so D.B. Was... Cooper thing, they sent, he sent letters to the, to the police with the D.B. Cooper jump. After the D.B. Cooper jump, he sent letters to the police after the uh, uh, Black Dahlia murder. The first letter they ever sent to anybody, I, w I got it here somewhere. I don't know where I couldn't find it. I was looking a while ago. It was a little, oh, well, but it's on my book. If you can see right up here, okay, there's yeah. a picture of the note that they sent to the warden of Alcatraz. And I think it says, ha ha, we made it. Yeah, we made it. And the, yeah, they and, made it ashore. And eventually Frank wrote a book called ha ha ha. We made it. Oh, okay. And, okay. Yeah. And, and, and it was, and is signed as being written by DB Cooper. Really? <laughs> Frank pulled, yeah. He could pull all that off and never get caught. It's, it's incredible. And I had the, a copy of the book here. I don't know where it's at. I've been looking for it. It cost me $139 because, you know, you can't, it's hard, you can, so really hard to get. And it had, I, it was used when I bought it, but, oh man, Frank, but the D.B. Cooper thing and all of these, he also sent collages and I have some videos on the uh, collages that he sent because interestingly enough, because he tried to get me to write my name for him and stuff like that. And I did a couple times, I printed my name. He said, write it for me now, print it. You look at this one uh, uh, collage that he sent to the, or it's not even a collage. I think he actually wrote it. Uh, he drew the letters. The whole collage is in block letters. All the letters are the same until you get to some word that has a D at the beginning of it. Just one word, one time. And that D is in handwriting. It's not in the block letter printing. Uh, okay. I kept wondering about that and wondering about that. Then it, it, re, it occurred to me, wait a minute, wait a minute. I remember him showing me that thing in Mexico, showing me the, uh, the letter D and saying, does that look familiar to you? <laughs> remember you wrote your name for me last time you were here? That oh, D so stands, if once you don't notice it until you look, but when you start looking, you go, wow, that's a handwritten D. That D is the way I write D when I write my name, David. And he so took you, it and traced it into the card that went to the uh, to the press on the uh, DB Cooper jump. That's terrifying. It is. <laughs> that it you is. have and your that, handwriting on that letter, yeah. It uh, is. And when I when I went back to to before I went to Mexico that time, my policeman friend in in uh, over there in Tampa was telling me, don't. Stay away. I mean, do stay away from this guy when you get down because he's going to find some way to get you wrapped up in what he's doing. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, you know, and I want to get on the police department. He goes, it's not going to help you to get on the police department if he does. And I'm like, OK, I'll stay away from him. But I end up running into him anyway. But he uh, he, he yeah, he well, my my the D and my name is on his D.B. Cooper letter. That's uh, 
I don't know. You know, it's like you said, it's terrifying, but uh, it's more proof that I don't, I'm not making this up. And you can ask me this story a million times and, uh, you know, I'm always going to tell it the same way because I'm not making things up. I'm telling you true life events that happened to me when I was a kid. <clears throat> there, uh, no, let me ch- let me bring up another thing. Uh, there, the DB Cooper jump. There, they say that he had to be have the uh, DB Cooper was actually someone who was in the military because how else would he have known how to open the aft? door of the uh airplane which was i think originally made uh, i'm not sure if it was a big door or a small door but anyway he, how would he know how to to do that because i don't i think even the pilots didn't know how to do that okay and, well yeah. w- one second okay. because we were talking about it while you were gone um not everybody apparently knows about db cooper i know all well, i don't know about all about db cooper i'm familiar with the story so db cooper Hijacked ahead, an airplane. I'll, I'll sum it up or you sum it up. Yeah, yeah. He hijacked an airplane, demanded money as a ran- ransom for it. Then the, he had him take it back off, and he jumped out over the forest in Washington State. And mm-hmm. nobody's ever found him, apparently. And so a lot of yeah, people say I he did. died. <laughs> okay, well, a lot of people say he died. They said he couldn't have jumped out with a parachute and lived. Yada, yada. It's kind of a big mystery, but he stole a bunch of money. Um, yeah. And, I and have so a this chapter was chapter in my book on that, on that jump, what he told me about that jump. Hmm. But go ahead. Oh, no, no, that's just the basics because uh, they were saying that they were familiar with his story. And they said, how would he know how to, unless he was in the military? Well, Frank wasn't in the military. He spent his life in prison. When he was 19 years old, he got his first prison sentence uh, as an adult, and he in and out of prison the rest of his life. Um, But uh, let me see here. I have his uh, I have his prison card from Alcatraz. He used this on me in Mexico a few times and showed it to me and said, "Do you recognize?" He covered up his face. Said, "You, you recognize? You think you recognize this guy?" Huh. I told him, "No, I never saw him before." But he was trying to find out if I remembered him from childhood. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, from Tampa. Attack. So he remembered what? you. Huh? So he remembered you as a kid. When, when you read yeah it. eventually eventually he put that together because i remember him tell asking me a few questions wait a minute did you live over on minnehaha street and i go yeah and he goes and he get really angry because i he got cut trying to cut me one time on minnehaha street and he still had to kill me for that you know <laughs> but wow. yeah my point if i answered your question if i didn't answer your question ask me more but the point i want to make right now is that how did this guy know db cooper know how to open that door that um that door on that on that plane if uh if the pilots didn't know how and mm-hmm. i'm going to tell you how um the first of all i told you that he was friends with arthur lee allen who got blamed for being the zodiac killer and that's why my police friends said stay away from him because he ties up his friends in this thing yeah and um but arthur lee allen was he was killing animals but he never graduated past that anyway backtrack to db cooper um how did frank know how to open that well uh you know and he was not in the military. The guy, that's, he was D.B. Cooper, you know, but that leads people in the wrong direction, okay? Now, Frank told me, he said, they're trying to figure out how I knew how to open that door on that plane. And I go, you mean you went and did a jump and you had to open the door yourself? And he goes, ah, well, you know, sometimes that happens. And I'm like, okay, uh, so what happened? Well, you know, they... Uh, I don't know what all he said, but he said something about blueprints. Uh, so the like, blueprints. Yeah. Now, where would he get the blueprints for a 747 or whatever it was? I don't remember. But Arthur Lee Allen was uh, in the Navy. Because he told me, uh, Frank told me, he said, I got them from a friend. And the friend, I'm sure, was Arthur Lee Allen. And he had the blueprints he, to the plane. Yeah, he said Arthur Lee Allen got him a job one time, the only job he ever had in his life, and he couldn't last a whole day. He wanted to kill people <laughs> because uh, having to making him look for things. Psychopaths can't they can't wait in line and they can't uh, 
uh, look for things that drives them crazy. But anyway, what I want to show you on here, Frank also said, he said, the, well, you, you know how to open them if you, if you had the blueprints. He didn't say he, that he got them from this guy. And I go, but he said that if you had them, and I go, well, did you have them? And he wouldn't answer me. And I said, um, and then he goes, but just having them is not enough. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, you took that drafting class when you were in junior high school. This guy was outside of my schoolroom window watching me in school. They end up killing a teacher there that I liked and a girl that I liked because they couldn't get me. And um, all my life, I never knew why those girls disappeared. But then when I put the pieces of the puzzle together, it all come clear and it wasn't any fun. But anyway, my point is how, you know, he said you have to know how to read uh, blueprints. You know, just having them is not enough. And right here on his prison card from Alcatraz when it where it tells what type of work he did can you see there where it says where was my finger at where it says blueprint man mm -hmm. can you okay, see yeah. that yeah yeah it's kind of in blue and kind of messed up hazy but it, okay yeah, says, yeah it says he wore it says occupational skills mechanic I think it says laborer after that, but part of it's not on page. And then it says blueprint man. So he knew he how to read blueprints. Yeah. He knew how to read blueprints because he'd taken classes in that just like I had. That's what he was trying to tell me. Okay. Wow. And then Arthur Lee Allen gave him the blueprints and that gave him yeah, enough knowledge to was, know how to open the plane door. Right. Because he was in the, in the Navy and most of those airplanes were used as same airplanes were used mm -hmm. as military aircraft that were used for, um, uh, airliners that's that is, uh any more anything else you want to know about db cooper geez. well <laughs> was there any information he gave you about the money that db cooper stole or yeah as a matter of fact i know where it's at <laughs> some of it most we're gonna have to it. talk after this after this interview david <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah uh the thing is is he was really really smart and he would uh you know that bank they robbed in Alabama to uh, they, they got, got them in Alcatraz. In Alcatraz. Yeah. It's on a city and a state line. Part of the bank I think is in one city, and part of it's in the other city state line. So robbing the bank would be complicated because they didn't know who to call, what police department to call back yeah. then. They didn't work together like they do now. Well, he did the same thing up there. He buried the money in a gray in a graveyard that uh has a that has a state line going right through the middle of it and um the two parts of it are in dispute from two different lodges of who actually owns it so he knows that they're not going to dig up that money huh, I yeah, because it's disputed land where they, huh because it's disputed land yeah and I stepped on the places where it's at and I went to the police up there but they didn't even want to talk to me they wouldn't come out from behind the bulletproof window they just figured i was probably another nutcase that because there's a lot of nutcases on the internet that'll tell you they got all the answers you know and they they just they got it from looking at the internet or whatever well i got it from knowing the guy and i stepped on some places up there when i i went up there to, to lake tahoe where the and i found the grave based on directions that he gave me and i have a video on youtube about, about it. it's called donna lass's grave because he they killed a girl from lake tahoe and they buried her up there and that he and, got uh, you're in a video you said he was buried next to her yeah because or from he, what you uh, what you're guessing is is that's where he's, yeah, he's at now i'm pretty sure he's buried in there with her and probably dig him up and find his he'll probably have his zodiac killer uniform and some other things buried there with him Huh. And he may still, I may be wrong, he may still be alive because he has family in Washington State. But if he is alive, he only has one lung because he had to go to the hospital because of lung cancer. Back okay. in 2009, I think it was. And, uh, but that, that, that just gives you a little hint of how he, he got that, that door open and then jumped out and, he told me, he said it was crazy as hell. I jumped out with only a pair, pair of penny loafers on and, uh, you know, a, a windbreaker jacket. And it was freezing cold and raining. And I go, so he goes, you know what the abyss is? And I go, 
yeah in that like darkness he goes yeah it was dark and i go <laughs> he's standing he was standing on the back of the plane looking out there and i go didn't it scare you and he goes yeah they're still trying to figure out what that wet spot was on the spot where i was standing <laughs> and I, yeah and i i had to i had to know i couldn't well, how, well what was it and he goes i pissed my pants before <laughs> i jumped and, and amazingly enough that's that's uh what do you call it evidence you know i mean now they yeah. could do dna tests mm -hmm. on it if they kept any of it but they probably didn't even realize what it was, but he, that's what he told me. And part of the reason that he did this was to try to overcome his fear. He had a fear of heights mm. and flying. Okay. And part of the reason he did that jump was to um, to try to overcome the, that. Well, hijacking that's a plane that. and demanding money and jumping out is definitely one way to overcome your fear of heights. Yeah, you kind of do that. Yeah, you know. Wow. But you're but, you're saying that the the money is buried at Donna's grave, or that's that's where he's buried. Some of it is buried there, because I uh -huh. asked him. I said, yeah, he said I asked him where'd you bury? He goes, well, some here and some there and some over there. But I walked across places around her grave where I sunk into the ground. I'm like, something's buried here, you know. Now it's a graveyard, but it's not a human graveyard. It's a pet graveyard. Huh. where uh they just sprinkle ashes uh, okay okay pets. people from i don't know where but i guess they're part owners in the lodge or something but they made this little grave for him you'll have to wa watch my video on donna lass's grave you see and and this can shake me up a little bit because he gave me some details about that he showed me pictures of things that i found when i went up there because he told me when you go up there it'll be there and I can't believe, you know, 50 years later, I go up there and all these things are still there that he said would be there. And uh, he, in particular, he glued a cross onto a rock that was her headstone. And the headstone was colored from having soaked in water to where it looked like a sun was shining on, on her. And it's a really a beautiful little scenery there. The light comes through the trees just right and everything's pleasant and it's cool all the time, most of the time. He, he said that she would uh, spend eternity in a beautiful place or something like that. I tell you exactly what he said on the uh, video. I can't remember how okay, he said yeah. it right now. But the, the, uh, he showed me a picture of that headstone with that cross on it. And when he showed me the picture, he handed me a cross. And I go, this is the cross that you're going to be looking for when you go up there. And I go, well, I'm going up where? What are you talking about? And he goes, put this in your hand. And I put the cross in my hand, and I, he says, I want you to remember that. And I go, okay, okay, I'll remember. So later on, he tried to get me to go up there, <coughs> tell the police where her grave was at, because there was a $10,000 reward for her finding her. And he wanted me to go up there and have him dig her up and, uh, um, you know, collect the reward and bring it back to him in Mexico so they'd have money. Mm. Wow. I okay, wanted you yeah. to be the guy to get the money for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And I imagine they would have killed me when I brought it to them. But most then, likely. Uh, and, and, and and let's go back to the D.B. Cooper money, because some of it's buried in that graveyard. And yeah, you could have gone up and gotten that and brought it back. Well, I'm going to tell you the reason why at the end of this story, why I first of all, I'm not going to dig in a graveyard. OK, uh, you know, I went to the cops and tried to get them to do it. They didn't want to go up there. But uh, there's another reason. I'll get to it. There's a place in Tampa where I uh, used to play at a park, and my mom used to take us down there for a picnic and everything, and he almost tried to kill me when we were having a picnic there. He told me, he said, your mom, your whole family, you're all lucky that you're still alive. And I go, what do you mean? What are you talking about? You're pissing me off, you know, and I'd get angry and make him back down. But anyway, uh, he told me, he said, most of the money's up there and um and i go okay so you say the money from the db cooper jump the two hundred thousand, and he'd he'd talk around it somehow to keep me confused but he goes you remember that rock you used to set on down there in uh by that pond in lowry park and i was like yeah and he goes well you need to go down there and take another look at it okay and there was this huge rock and it had a chip out of it about this wide. And I, you know, we're little kids, me and my, <clears throat> me and my sister. And I would uh, sit in that little 
crack in the uh, that tip that was missing. It was a little dip that we could sit in, and we would, and there was trees everywhere. There's little trees, and we would, I, I, I would pretend like me and she and I were king and queen, and these were our subjects, you know. And you know, five years old, we just laugh about it or whatever. Well, when he told me that, I figured. I don't know what he's talking about. And I went back to that place and looked at it a few times and didn't really get anything until after I wrote the book. And then all of a sudden I was like, hey, man, I need to go down there and do it. And I did a couple of videos in that park. And I found I went to that rock where I used to set. And I'm like, this rock, we're talking about something. I can't believe three guys could move it. That's how big it is. But they did it. And he said several times about well, these guys, the guys that moved that rock knew how to work with rocks. Well, that's what they did in Leavenworth when they were in prison. The Anglin brothers <laughs> moved rocks, so they knew how. <clears throat> that rock, it was like, you know, I'm going to shrink it down like this, but it was huge. Uh -huh. as, as done this. Let me just do it, show you this. The rock was like this. There was a place here that we set now the rock has been lifted and flipped over here okay the right so the place you is upside down yeah it's upside down the the cut is in here on the opposite side of the rock that's where the rest of the money's at because he told me that the rest of the money you ought to go down there and look around he said it's in uh you know and and something about he, he, he gave me enough details on how it looked i went you'll see me if you watch my video on on that lowry park videos You'll see me going around trying to figure things out and trying to figure things out. And then finally figured out, and I think I did another video, and I said, that's where it's buried. It's underneath that rock. But I don't show them enough detail to where somebody can go down there and start digging it up. Yeah. You know, I want to be the one that, that, uh, it yeah, yeah, that's... For knowing where it's at. <laughs> you know, and he didn't tell anybody else where it was at. But now, why didn't I dig? <coughs> Frank told me, you ever hear of the curses that uh, the the um, the Egyptians put on the mummies yeah. when they oh, bury when they them? them? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I go, yeah, that was like a mercuric oxide. One, he goes, yeah, yeah. And uh, he goes, well, we put a curse on that money. And I'm like, you did? And he goes, yeah. Yeah, and I know how to make bombs, too. You know, I wanted to show you how to make a bomb. He tried to get me in his house so he could show me how to make a bomb. And I'm like, don't leave me alone. I don't care about no damn bombs. And, uh, well, but it might become in handy sometime in your life. And I go, no, no, I don't need to know that. And I kept on going. Got away that time. But uh, the uh, mercuric oxide curse thing. Finally, he told me, he said, no, nah, didn't, we didn't put anything in there. That's, you know. But the fact that he said it to me. You know, I'm still not going to dig in somebody else's graveyard without permission and without the Especially cops. If there's there. maybe a bomb or poison, and you may open up the bag and end up dying. Yeah. <laughs> and huh. uh, yeah, my cop friends in Tampa told me because I told him about all that. And he said, "Police aren't going to dig it up, even if you find it, and you're sure they're not. We're not going to help you with that because we don't want to be." take the risk of being exposed to something like that or digging up a bomb that's going to explode. Yeah. Hmm. But you... they have more technology now that they can, they have LIDAR. They can look down there with radar and see what's down there. Yeah, that's can, true. Yeah, they scan it. You know, a lot of other things now that they didn't have back then. Right. But, uh, you know, law enforcement is not interested in it. Uh, the FBI agent I told you was a patient of mine said there's not enough, uh, uh, it's too old. The case is so old. We can't throw, we don't want to throw any money into it because, um, it's just too old. And a lot of people don't even know what it's about. We have so many other cases popping up every single day that are current and we need to take care of them. Well, Frank knew that the longer, more he could push it back, the, the less attention it would get. But, uh, just you knowing it's there, I don't know, you know, I mean, I, uh, I, I, I want to feel like a special person because I know something no one else knows. No, that's fascinating. <laughs> it sucks it sucks are you saying you can't tell people because they don't believe you. Do you remember the last time you had contact with any of them? Yeah, it was around 1994, I think, three or two or three, early 90s, because that was when I was in chiropractic college. Remember I told you that I yeah. told him I was in chiropractic college, but I lied about which college it was. Yes. And he caught me right away and said, you're lying. Mm-hmm. 
that was in the early 90s. Mm. Gotcha. Wow, that is that is so and, fascinating. Oh. And at that time, that's when he showed me that book that he wrote called Ha Ha Ha. Right. Okay. I, I just looked up Ha 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 when you were talking about it. Yeah, I found it. Yeah, it says, yeah, authored by D.B. Cooper. Yeah, um, and if you look, and you want to, and I have videos on that on YouTube, look closely at how the letters are drawn and go dig up that, uh, the note that the, uh, that they wrote to the warden of Alcatraz where they put ha ha and compare the two. He wrote them in a similar fashion so that you could see that it's the same ha ha. Uh, okay. Okay. Wow. <clears throat> and he even uh. told me that he goes, see, and one of them, the H is like this with the line in here. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I, he goes, what does that look like? Yes, it looks like a V. And he goes, yeah, a V for victory. Because mm. we won. <laughs> we won. He was real proud of himself. That is, You know, one is... thing, one easy way that they could catch this guy is all the cigarette butts that they've found around all of these crimes of his have his DNA on them, and they're all the same brand. He would exclusively smoke Raleigh filters. And the D.B. Cooper cigarette, somewhere I found that, that it, it was a Raleigh filter. Raleigh Cooper, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And they know that from prison. So they should know that from his prison records. And I'm not sure if I found it in his prison records or not. But he was always trying to get me to bring him a carton or two of Raleigh filters to Mexico because the uh, tobacco down there was inferior at that time. That that is insane. I had no idea about the whole DB Cooper connection. But the, let's let's go through this real quick, uh, David. Um, I've after going through your TikTok channel, you you've like said he's easily involved in in a lot of different murders that I never associated with the Zodiac Killer or the the yeah. um, Banglin brothers. At least so, thirty thousand. Like, that is ridiculous. But you you've mentioned OJ's wife, JFK, John Bonet Ramsey. Um, and then you're talking to Black Dahlia. I'm trying to, I don't know the Black Dahlia murder. I think I watched a movie about that, but it was definitely not current. That was like about some old like Civil yeah, War lady. 45, around 45. Right huh. after they he uh, got out, was released after that, when he was put in prison at 19 years old and around 20 or 21, two, he was released because of good behavior or whatever. I don't know or he did his time or whatever. They got together over there and they were heading across the country to um, uh, to go back to Florida and then killing people all across the country. And this place that I told you about, this place in the Four Corners, I think it is, is up there. And that's when he went and did this. And then from there, they went to Texarkana and did the Moonlight Murders. And from there... I don't know where, but they unfortunately ended up in Florida because that's where they were always going because the Anglins have a big family down there that they would go and visit. Huh. And what was the association? Because I found this super fascinating with the JFK assassination. You were saying Frank was actually the babushka lady. That's what he said. And I asked him how, I mean, she's pretty short. How did you, how did you do that? And he goes like this. And he's squatting down and he's holding his arms out like this to show you that he was squatting down with that big skirt on. <clears throat> when but I look you... at her, I, I have trouble believing that it was him. But at the same time, look at those three people's faces. I also have videos on YouTube. If you go into the JFK connection or whatever on my YouTube videos where I single these guys out and bring the pictures up of their faces. Because Frank told me that they went in there wearing masks, dressed like women. And that uh, they uh, had done it before and it worked for them because they did. They dressed like women at the Anglin brothers' mother's funeral so that they could go huh. to it after they escaped from Alcatraz. Did you know about that? No. Yeah, yeah. The Anglin brothers dressed. I don't think Frank was there or he was somewhere else, but they dressed as women and, and they're... went to the funeral so, so that they could see their mom get buried. And they got oh, the because they were wanted. Yes, yeah. It. The FBI suspected they would be there, but that's how they got out of it. They were dressed like women, and then they just kind of disappeared. But the he he made jokes about the mask. Something went wrong, and they bubbled up on their faces. And I'm like, the the mask bubbled up. Why? And he goes, well, that's the way. He wouldn't tell me much about that, but I I don't know if they killed somebody to steal those masks. But I think he got them 
I think it got in some place like Universal Studios and got uh, those masks for them. And uh, they bubbled up. He said, I don't know why they didn't arrest us just because of the mask. We looked so weird with those masks all bubbled up and everything. Well, and I went and looked. I started thinking one day, well, if the three of them were out there, they should be wearing those masks and they should be bubbled up. So I started looking at all the pictures I could find on it. And sure enough, there they are with these bubbles in these masks. So I show you close up pictures of these guys. And I tell you, that's Frank Morris. That's John Anglin and you, the heights and everything fit and the weights and everything else. But they're wearing masks. They're dressed like women. Mm, and that's... they went there. He said they went there. To, he was going to put a gun inside a camera and take a shot at the president. I go, why were you going to do that? And he goes, ah, oh, no, I wasn't really going to do it. But it just I got mad. You know, like it's like people when they're in prison, they hate the warden and they want to kill him. It's kind of like that. I'm like, oh, okay. And uh, that's what he was going to do. But I told him, did you take the gun down there to Dealey Plaza? He goes, no, nah, we, we decided we left it back in the hotel room. And they probably didn't stay in a hotel but because they would steal a car and stay in the car. But he, he uh, uh, they, uh, they didn't take it down there. So they didn't and went down there with the camera and they're taking pictures now. Uh, the you, you, you know that the babushka lady, when she's doing her thing out there, there's a picture of her there with the camera filming and filming when he's getting his head blown apart. Um, are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have uh, to, yeah, you have to go look at that Zapruder film or somebody's and, and film they, that shows they, well, her. They never found everybody her film else, though. Everybody else is on their stomach. Everybody's scared shitless. And Frank Morris, the Bush Bushka lady, is there as close as she can get and trying to get closer to get video of him getting his brains blown out because that's what turned Frank Morris on. So, so that's he, what makes me sure that when he told me Bush that, he was lady. telling the truth. Say again? So he was not actually the shooter. No. He was just there filming no. it. How did they he were know there that filming. it was going to happen? Who, who else would film something like that? A psychopathic well, murderer where everybody else was ducking to keep from getting shot. He didn't care. He wanted that. That death was more important to him. How did he, he know that the assassination film. was going to take place? Huh? How did he know that the assassination was going to take place? He didn't know it was going to be an assassination. He just went down there to to meet the president. He wanted to. <laughs> well, I think he wanted to kill him. because He, he had thought he about killing him, but he left the gun back there, as you said. Yeah, so he was yeah, just filming yeah, it. Yeah, and it just so happened that they did kill him. Frank probably studied the whole thing and said this would be the place to do it. Okay. And he then, may have had some tips from some other people because one of the guys who's in prison who claimed he was on the other side of the grassy knoll behind the fence or picket fence or whatever, I think Frank knew that guy. Uh, okay. And I in one of your TikToks, I think it was, or maybe it's on YouTube, but you had talked about um, the actual shot came from a manhole that the car was driving over. Uh, not really a manhole. Uh, uh, these sewer things that are on the side of the road. Oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, the drainage. Where the water yeah. goes down. Yeah, that kind of thing. Because they, they had me believing it was a manhole because a manhole took a bullet shot. And, but... Uh, and I, yeah, in the TikTok, I told you that Frank, what Frank told me about that was, because I asked him, I said, you were down there. Who do you think shot the guy? And he goes, Jesus Christ, are you kidding? There was about nine people out there shooting at him. And I go, really? So when I see these conspiracy theory things that say there were eight or nine people shooting at him, <laughs> I mean, Frank, cause, you know what Frank told me? He said, and I know a lot about gunshots. Well, he should, because he shot a lot of people. And I go, well, where do you think the one that killed him came from and he goes well, one the last one that killed him well they need to look down that manhole or that sewer huh. drain or i don't remember what he called it and he goes they wouldn't tell me anymore you know but when i saw that that there were two fbi agents in the sewer drain with rifles i'm like <laughs> that fits it all fits and that would have took the bullet up here and threw his head back like that because that's yeah, the whole confusing other, part yeah there's no yeah not being shot from behind you're going to take you forward <clears throat> that kind of thing mm. wow and uh, real quick because we we i have i want to get to a couple of things just about you david not necessarily all the killings uh, okay. but real quick um how is it related to oj's wife um what was your question about oj's wife you i think in a video you had said that frank had like once suggested that he had actually killed oj's wife not oj yeah 
yeah, I call it the O.J. Simpson murders, but uh, you know it doesn't mean he was murdered. Uh, it was O.J. <laughs> and I think I think uh, Nicole Brown Simpson, his wife, and her bodyguard, I think, were having an affair, and that kind of thing would drive Frank crazy. And I don't know if Frank uh, knew about that and went up there and talked to O.J. about it and said, "We'll <clears throat> do him in for you" or something, or I'm, I'm, you know, or he just decided to get him for it, and I'm not sure. Only thing I know about that is what Frank told me, and the only thing he told me is he said something about that. And I, he, you know, he always would ask me, "Do you know about the Nicole Brown O.J. Simpson thing or whatever?" And I go, "Yeah, I heard a little bit about it, but you know, what the heck really happened there?" And he goes, "Well, you, you see that thing on court where he, they tried to put that uh, O.J. tried to put that glove on that that they found out there." And I go, "Yeah," and he goes, "It wouldn't fit him," and I and I go, "Yeah," and he turned his back to me and he held his hand up like this, and he goes. And I looked at his hand and I go, that hand would fit in the glove. And he turned around and goes like this, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> and, and then he, then he changed. Did you do that? No, no, I didn't do that. Are you kidding? I don't do it. <clears throat> so still never admitting it, but yeah, definitely, definitely hinting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then lastly, hey, I'm going to go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to ask about John Bonet Ramsey. Cause that one yeah. really was out of left field. It was really out of left field, but they hated her. Not, let me just tell you, the, before they killed her, I was in Mexico City with him, and he was telling me, because he hated women, and he said all women were, you know, whatever. I did a video on that. He took it down and put a strike against me on Facebook, said that I was making a hate speech against a group of people. Like, you know, that's what he thought. It wasn't what I thought, but he... uh too sensitive for them, I guess. Probably some women complained, but you know, complain about Frank Moore as the Zodiac killer. That's why he murdered women. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but what uh, were what were we just saying about that? Or what was his connection with the John Benet Ramsey murder? Because I, I barely even know that John Benet Ramsey was like the the child that was in like the child modeling. Her parents yeah, put her in and it. when yeah, and at that time. Uh, she was on TV all the time. She was the news every day. Yeah. This little beautiful little model, and she was out there modeling like a grown person. And that just really drove him crazy because she had makeup on and everything, and that she needs to pay, and her parents need to pay, and this and that. <coughs> and that was one year. The next year, I went back to Mexico. He said, you hear what happened to John Bonet Ramsey? And I go, yeah, they killed her or something. And he goes, yeah, um, she shouldn't, you know, she shouldn't have been doing that. And her parents needed to pay for it, too. And I go, well, how is that? And I don't remember how he told me this story. But what's in stayed in my head is <clears throat> that they got in the house probably through that open window. You know, they talk about an open window in the cellar or something because Frank would never break an entry because he knew from his friends in prison that that's how everybody got caught because you okay. leave evidence when you do that. If you will go through an open door, not only that, but if you go through an open door and someone's missing, they don't consider it an abduction. They just figure the person left. Okay. So, so they won't even investigate the murder. And, uh, I lost a girlfriend like that, a couple of girlfriends like that. But anyway, uh, um, John Benet Ramsey. Yeah. He said, uh, He, he, just the things he said about how she had to pay and everything, I pieced it together that um, they come in through that window, they caught the parents, and they made them watch them choke this girl and torture her or whatever. And uh, that's why the parents didn't want to talk about it to the police. And that's how he made the parents pay. Yeah, and they told maybe told them we're gonna kill you now. You, you you know put the gun to their head now. You you make up your mind. Do I blow your brains out or do we kill her? Oh, you know that uh, kind of thing. That could yeah, be really, yeah. Maybe give them a choice they, that they have to live with. They wouldn't. Well, yeah, they got to live with it, and they don't want to tell anybody and 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 that kind of thing. But I'm sure that that's what happened at that that murder. Frank and them because they typically choke the people with. A wire or something. That's the way they killed uh, Bob Crane, uh, Hogan's Heroes. Oh, I didn't know uh, that. 
Yeah, and he told me about he told me stories about that. He what happened was he Bob Crane was a hypersexual guy, and he would get girls into hotels and film the uh, having sex with them. And uh, he had a girl in there, and he um, they I guess the girl left, and they the guys come in there and they got him. They beat him to death with the tripod that he used to put the camera on, or they beat him with it, and then they then they choked him with a garrote. And he had a semen sample on his thigh, and the dumb cops didn't keep the sample. And, you know, Frank hinted around that it was his. <clears throat> because he, he's sitting there watching them choke the guy and yeah. doing, you know, that kind of thing. And that's what happened. Wow. Well, changing subjects, David. <laughs> that, that, yeah. That's so I much like... <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, and by all means, you know, you're free to free to take a break whenever you need. But I was wanting to know a little bit about your personal life because your TikTok's not just the Zodiac. There's some other really fascinating things that I wanted to get into. But I was just okay. overall wanting to know, um, and you can answer what you want to answer or don't. Uh, are you currently married? I'm in an open marriage. We we haven't gotten divorced yet. Okay, okay. Uh, do you have kids? I have a daughter who's 22 years old, and and she has a little boy. Okay, uh, I was gonna ask about your Very age, but you already girl. Very oh, beautiful good. girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you you have a ranch in Texas now. And I live on a ranch in Texas. Okay, um, and then I was gonna ask because you had mentioned having patience, and I wasn't sure what your job was, but now it, you're a chiropractor. I'm a chiropractor, and I don't tell this on uh, on the internet. Um, hardly at all i don't want people to know that well I'm yeah you don't you don't need to give any details by only yeah keep your but privacy I am, i'm a chiropractor and i own a health club a gym oh that's what i was gonna i was also gonna ask about your gym because because we've i've seen your videos in the gym yes far as gym. gym yeah <laughs> in the city of far <laughs> uh so that that's what i was gonna ask about is is your your workout routine you got a lot of videos of working out and yeah, it's because I'm I'm also a professional wrestler, and I, you have a match coming up in October, which I want to hear about. Four, four matches. Oh wow! Cool. So, do, what is I don't? What kind of wrestling like? Is this wrestling. professional well, uh, wrestling? When I think of professional wrestling, I think of like WWE. Okay, me, yeah, uh, like sure. theatrical. Let me just shorten it down for you and tell you about theatrical stuff it, it's still athletic and it's very dangerous and you don't know if somebody says look i'm gonna grab you this way and throw you that way you don't know if he's gonna do it or try to kill you, well, you people know? die in that so, yeah and yeah, I mean, it happens every few years when, one of those guys dies it, it's a fight when you're out there but anyway <clears throat> uh, the kind of wrestling i do is kind of like the old wwf because that's when okay I grew wow up yeah and uh <laughs> around here what they do is lucha libre the mexican style oh yeah absolutely acrobatics but i don't i'm not into the acrobatics i can do them and i do them a little bit but then you have to depend more on the other person because you're trying to do these acrobatics together and they can really kill you mm. but so i try to get the guys to wrestle wwf and uh you know you're supposed to think it's all real and uh, you know it's real when i'm no, out that's there. <laughs> awesome yeah that's why i was curious i wasn't sure like what kind of wrestling yeah you were you were participating in do you have like a persona yeah, David Gold. The oh, David Gold is a persona, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's me, David Gold. I had a, <clears throat> a persona called the Rebel Rocker at one time when I first started wrestling in Canada. But uh, I kind of dropped it in Mexico because it involved a, a flag uh, um, like the Freebirds had, a robe made out of a flag. And uh, they in Mexico, they didn't like that. They said that you're not uh, supposed okay, to be okay. carrying flags, and that flag has to do with racism and all these things. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. And they let me wear it anyway because the fans liked it. But I finally quit wearing it because I just didn't want people. I figured if there's one person out there that thinks I'm a racist, I don't want them to see me with the flag. Huh. And and tell us about the matches that you have coming up. Is that going to be near your hometown? Is there a way like we can watch that online or anything? Uh, if sometimes they put it online, Valley Wrestling Matches, VWAM, sometimes they film that and they'll put it online on their website and or their Facebook site, um, Valley Wrestling Matches. But, uh, and there are some of my matches on there, I think, 
but uh, <clears throat> the uh, it's at a, there's a basilica down the street. It's a, a big Catholic church, and uh, they have a, a immigration festival every year in October out in the parking lot, and they have a lot of um, places where you can get something to eat, and they're cooking out there and everything, and and they have bands, and then they have a wrestling ring there, and we put on matches for them. That is That's really that is cool. fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd been I'd been super like intrigued whenever I heard you talking about the wrestling match that you've been getting ready for. Um, and okay. in addition to that, Aqua, the guy in the blue, he's he's pretty big into working out. Uh, okay. so I, I knew I knew he is going to be curious about you you like your workout regime and uh, and little yeah. I didn't know that you're actually like owner owner of the gym. Yeah, I'm the owner of the gym. <laughs> Part owner, you might say part owner. I mean, your wife's gonna take everything away from you when you get divorced, so you're only part. <laughs> yeah, um, we have like an ongoing joke that uh, I'm supposed to be preparing for a marathon, so I was just wondering if you had any tips to stay motivated to working out. Like, um, I don't know how long you've been into it, but. You seem to be quite regimented with your with your exercise, which is great. I've been working out since I was 15, and yeah, right now business is picked up in my clinic, so I'm not getting out there on the workout floor as much as I need to. But you know, I have a set of routines that I do that's kind of like bodybuilding and strength building, and then I have a power lifter here that I train with who trains me, and he tries to kill me every time because you know, and I do it because it's like you you beat me up so much i tell him you beat me up so much i don't need wrestling practice <laughs> right uh, and it's a thing where we'll do one exercise here go to this equipment and do another exercise and over there and do another exercise then he'll do the whole thing while i rest and then i have to go through it again with no rest right and yeah. and you know what kind of routine is it yeah it's like that <laughs> So you have someone that like keeps you, beats you up. going, beats you up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I tell him you beat me up, you know. But then when he's not here, I have my own routine which I developed over the years, uh, which I got most of it from, you know, reading things in magazines. And uh, I used to work at a gym many years ago when I was uh, uh, got out of the service, and I was in my twenties. I worked at a gym, and I, I learned the bot the. Uh, the uh, gym owner was a uh, winning bodybuilding contests all the time, and he, uh, I got the routine, routine kind of from him. We got seven minutes left. Oh, yeah, that's all we need. Um, yeah, because it's late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I appreciate you staying as long as you have. So, I had, um, I, I wanted to ask, so we have all this about the, the zodiac killings and everything else, but I wanted to ask something that we usually ask anytime we have guests is so far as like. Do you believe, what's your opinion on 9-11? 9-11? When I was, when that happened, I was on my way to my clinic, and I heard that an airplane had hit the World Trade Center, and by the time I got to the clinic, another one, and when I got in, the television was on, and I saw it on the television, and I saw the building go down, and I go, That's, that building was demolitioned. And I had to ask uh -huh. him, is that supposed to be the one that, that the plane hit because that was a demolition. I was in the demolitions when I was young. I just thought it was really interesting to watch these buildings come down. <coughs> so right Those from the get go, you were you were up. seeing seeing things as not as yeah. they were being portrayed. Yeah, an airplane would not do that. Okay, that you was all set thing, up, man. and the reason it was set up is because the guy Silverstein, who owned those buildings, they were going to have to close him down because from the 70th up to the 74th floor, right where the planes hit, everything was covered in asbestos, and it was now illegal to have that. So take it. He took out a, a insurance policy on those buildings 30 days before the, the bombing. Yeah, I've that was that. all set up like that how they did it and convinced these guys in the airplanes to fly the airplanes in there. But I'm not so sure they did. Those guys might be hit out in their home country. And, you know, they, they, it may have been really missiles that hit it that were disguised as airplanes. I don't know how, how it was done, but that was not airplanes that took those. And they said that uh, those buildings could take up to about 20 hits from airplanes and not come down. Yeah. Okay, and, and then you can what... see thermite pouring down the side of the building. I mean, come on. <laughs> what about aliens and supernatural things like ghosts? We believe in aliens uh, and ghosts. Yeah, no. 
<laughs> no, I don't. Okay. I, you yeah. know, I did. I, well, for my youth, I did, I did, I did, and I couldn't get any way of proving any of it. And I just came to the conclusion that, you know, it, when it's convenient to sell clicks, you come up with an alien story. And when that doesn't work, you come up with a Zodiac killer story. And it don't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter how you tell the story, but I mean, that's what they do. They just tell it all kinds of weird Whether Every few months or years they come out, this guy was definitely the Zodiac killer. And at the bottom it says, but the police couldn't confirm, confirm it. <laughs> Which, by the way, I wanted, I don't know if I told you, but that note that they sent to the Alcatraz um, warden, the FBI confirmed that that was their signatures, which they made, wrote the note after they were supposed to have drowned. Oh, so the FBI slipped up a little bit by admitting that's them. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, David, I, yeah, I think we got like two minutes left or something. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure. I, I we could we Wait. could we could do this like five times over and we, there'd still be information. I feel like we only skimmed uh, the top of most of this. Uh, I which I know you feel <laughs> I have enough information to write at least five books and I could make movies, hour long movies, a sequence of about twenty of all of the things that have happened to me with this, these guys. I'd love to get a producer interested in this. Well, let's but shout I, out your I would all like your social to, media. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to uh, uh, get this podcast, if I can, in pieces so that I can shoot pieces of it to onto TikTok. Okay. Yeah, we can we can uh, try and get that to you. Yeah, uh, Kings. Yeah, Kings we can do, the, do that. Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, absolutely. But no, this has been a pleasure. So yeah, you are. Uh, what is your TikTok, uh, YouTube, and your Facebook and Instagram? David Gold four seven one. And is, it's that uh, on all of them? That's Instagram. And okay. I'm not sure what my TikTok is. You got your but... TikTok pulled up. I I believe it's the same thing. David Gold something numbers. I think it's the same. Yeah. It's yeah. seven one three five. Okay. David seven, Gold seven one three five on TikTok. Yeah, and uh, and the book is My Dance with the Zodiac Killer. You can buy it on Amazon, and that's where you're really going to get all your information. Yeah. Amazon, uh, Kindle books, um, the uh, what's that other one? Barnes and Nobles, but you have to get it online. They don't have it in any bookstores yet. I got to sell a lot of books before they put it online. <laughs> and by well, the way, all... the people, the people that published it, Christian Faith Publishing never pay me unless I dog them and say, hey, man, you guys haven't paid me. And they get all scared and everything, and they'll send me 100 bucks. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that. Hopefully you get a couple of more sales after this, though. But, David, it's been such a pleasure, man. Yeah, I think we're out of time. Great. But uh, hope you have a great night, and thank you so much for coming on. This has been Thanks awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, you David. Time, David.